So it's a, it's a great pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Brad Langford, uh, who's a board certified infectious disease pharmacist. Uh, he's a clinical pharmacist at the University of Toronto, uh, Canada. And um, uh, he's working in uh, provincial uh, public health and chronic care settings. He is also an assistant professor at the Dalla Lena uh, School of Public Health at University of Toronto. Brad has been involved in local, national, international antimicrobial stewardship. In fact, I had the opportunity to go through his um, extremely well-written uh, article in uh, Jack uh, and um, um, uh, 2020. So uh, a very well written and very informative article. And uh, he has collaborated with Public Health Agency of Canada, US Centers, uh, CDC, and um, World Health o Organization. His practice and research interests include antibiotic use, resistance awareness, knowledge translation, implementation science and stewardship, and evaluation of initiatives to improve the quality and safety of antibiotic use. Very interesting uh, talk. Uh, the su subject of the talk is very interesting. He has, as I told you, published on, on that uh, great article and also is an authority on that. So uh, let's hear his views on how uh, cognitive biases uh, describe our prescription habits and behavior and um, uh, uh, what best we can do to improve upon our prescriptions. So, uh, Dr. Brad Langford, and uh, thanks, Dr. Mayer and team for uh, inviting me and making a part of your uh, program once again. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sardana, for the kind introduction. And uh, and thank you, Dr. Rizvi, as well, for the, uh, for the invitation to speak to this group. It's always a, a pleasure um, to learn from uh, from your team. So my, top, uh, my talk today will be on cognitive bias and antimicrobial stewardship. And our objectives for today, so by the end of this talk, uh, we should be able to list some common cognitive biases um, as they apply to antibiotic prescribing, define and provide some examples of what we mean by the concept of nudging, and identify some examples of antimicrobial stewardship strategies that we can use to address and account for cognitive biases. So to set the stage, uh, we have to talk a little bit about thinking fast and slow or type one and type two thinking. Um, Dr. Uh, Daniel Kahneman wrote this nice book in 2011. He's a Nobel Prize winning uh, psychologist, psychologist and economist. And he uh, posits that there are two different modes to the way that we as humans think type one, which is fast and intuitive, and type two, two is more slow and deliberate. We spend a lot of time in type one because it's a lot more efficient, but it also involves making shortcuts. And some of those shortcuts, we call them heuristics, but when those shortcuts are um, result in incorrect uh, assumptions, they're called biases. And that's what we wanted to focus on today, which is cognitive biases. And it's interesting that this talk uh, uh, follows Dr. Soman's talk because I think he focuses a lot on how we can think about type two, uh, slow and deliberate thinking. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can take advantage of the fact that people may have cognitive biases and try to make things a little bit easier for people to do the right thing. So just a quick exercise to illustrate what I mean by cognitive biases. I want to ask this question to the group. So if you're to take a random word from the English dictionary, is it more likely that that word will either start with the letter K or is it more likely that that word will have letter K as the third letter? So you can reflect on this yourself. If you feel uh, comfortable, feel free to put your, your response into the chat. Um, but I'll tell you that when we ask this question to most people, um, most will say, it starts with the letter K. There's much more words that will start with the letter K. We can name them kitchen, kangaroo, kite, etc. However, the correct answer is number two. More words actually have letter K as the third letter. And the reason why we usually say the wrong answer is because it's much easier to remember words um, that start with letter K. And this is called availability bias, which is the tendency to overestimate events that are more easily recalled. And so this applies not only to the, you know, the 
words in a dictionary, but also to clinical practice. For example, if you've recently managed a patient who has bacteremia, you're much more likely to assume that your next patient has bacteremia and overestimate their probability. This is just one of many cognitive biases that exist in the practice of medicine, and, and several of those apply to antimicrobial stewardship. Our team wrote a paper on this in Jack Antimicrobial Resistance a couple of years ago, where we highlighted what some of those common cognitive biases that exist in antimicrobial stewardship are. I won't go through all of them, but at the bottom, I'll highlight one that I think is particularly important to antimicrobial stewardship, which is present bias. It's the tendency to favor smaller, more immediate benefits, that is prescribing the antibiotic now, over uh, more distant benefits that may be larger in the future, like the reduction of antimicrobial resistance and side effects for that patient, as well as a reduction in resistance for the population. So we'll have to think about ways that we can address some of these cogn cognitive biases through strategies with respect to stewardship. I want to first, though, illustrate a case of how uh, many cognitive biases may exist in just a daily practice, um, typical cases that we see in the hospital. And this is a, a case that's, um, that I've seen many times. Um, a patient whose, her, her name is Miss GH, and she's a 79-year-old long-term care resident uh, with confusion, but she doesn't have any urinary tract symptoms. So the patient's been transferred to you from an acute care hospital along with a note from the physician in the long-term care home that says the past medical history of the patient, history of presenting illness, and an indication that this uh, physician thinks it's a suspected urinary tract infection because the patient has foul smelling urine and altered mental status. So in the emergency department, the provider orders a urine culture, orders a urinalysis, and starts empiric antibiotics and IV fluids. And there's a preliminary diagnosis that goes onto the chart that says this patient has dehydration and query urinary tract infection. After 24 hours, the patient is back, is transferred back to the ward and appears much better. And her urine culture comes back positive for E. coli. Urinalysis looks like it's got uh, positive for leukocyte esterase and nitrates. And so the patient is continued on antibiotics for a seven day course and then is discharged back to long-term care on day four. So many of you may recognize this as a case of asymptomatic bacteriuria. Guidelines out there like the Infectious Diseases Society of America would say we should withhold antibiotics, um, not give antibiotics and watch and wait because there may be other reasons for this patient's uh, symptoms. For example, dehydration. However, this patient got a full course of antibiotics. Um, so what went wrong here? And I, I would, uh, I would point out to you that there's probably several cognitive biases at play. The first is diagnostic momentum. That is an initial incorrect suspicion. That is in this case, uh, they felt that this was a suspected urinary tract infection. That initial incorrect suspicion gathers momentum as it passes between individuals from the long-term care home to the hospital emergency department to the ward. Another bias here at play is called commission bias, and that's the tendency for us to feel that action is better than inaction. So we should do something for this patient, and by doing something, we're prescribing an antibiotic. And then finally, optimism bias. There's this feeling that let's be on the safe side by providing an antibiotic. The benefits of the antibiotic will generally outweigh their risks, which is, you know, a benign, uh, just a benign treatment. So these are some potential uh, risks that often come into play when um, making a decision about antibiotic prescribing we need to address in our stewardship strategies. Just to drive this point home further, this is a study that our team did in hospital um, in Toronto, Canada, where we made a number of different recommendations from our antimicrobial stewardship team to the prescriber. And this was very similar to the handshake stewardship that Dr. Soman was talking about. So we made 11,000 recommendations and 82% of those recommendations were accepted. But what's interesting is that certain recommendations were much more likely to be accepted. That is those recommendations that aim to increase the exposure for the patient. And that was a twofold odds of acceptance compared to recommendations that aim to decrease exposure. And that was a 0.7 fold odds. So 
recommendations that increase exposure are to start antibiotics, to increase the duration, escalate the spectrum. So basically more is better. And then recommendations that uh, stop antibiotics, shorten the duration or deescalate the spectrum were harder to convince clinicians to do that. So this I think shows commission bias is really at play with respect to antibiotic stewardship as well as optimism bias. So we, we should take these things into account when devising our stewardship strategies. So I'll show you some of those strategies that we can use. These are three different approaches to address cognitive biases. So first is to slow down, second is to reflect, and third is to make it easy. Good recommendations in general, right, from uh, a stewardship perspective, but just in general in life. So slow down means to take uh, an antibiotic timeout. So maybe 48 to 72 hours later, you have your culture results back. You may have some more laboratory data. You could reflect and say, maybe this is the time to switch from intravenous to oral. Perhaps we can shorten the duration or a deescalate therapy. Che checklists can be helpful as well as clinician-led prompting to help ensure that we are aligning with best practices and ensuring that appropriateness uh, of that antibiotic is, uh, is optimal. And then reflecting. So this, I think, uh, really aligns with the previous talk, considering the opposite. What, are the, what is the possibility that my initial suspicion may have been wrong? So there's some mnemonics out there. There's a great mnemonic to assess patients who have delirium so that you can think about potential other reasons for delirium aside from an infection. Uh, estimate the confidence of one's own diagnosis. This is called metacognition. And then finally, making it easy. So this is where I'm going to uh, spend most of my time talking about. Forced functions are a way that can help make, make it easy. So that is maybe if you have an electronic medical record, you can force um, the prescriber's hand in terms of prescribing more appropriate durations of therapy or including an indication for prescribing. But nudging, I think, is an underused opportunity uh, to make it easy for clinicians to do the right thing. So what is nudging? Nudging is any aspect of the choice architecture, and that means the way that choices are laid out, that alters a person's behavior in a predictable way without forbidding any options or significantly changing their incentives. And this comes from a very interesting book called Nudge uh, by Thaler and Sunstein. It's kind of a bit of a mouthful, so I've simplified it here. More simply, nudging is to gently guide decision-making while preserving that person's autonomy. So some nice examples of nudges that we experience in our daily life are road markings, alarm clocks, and warnings, for example, on cigarette packages. So all of these help to guide your behavior. They align in general with the user's best interest. The user still has autonomy. You could still wake up late. You could snooze that alarm clock, or you could still smoke that cigarette. And there are no direct incentives or disincentives if you don't um, wish to follow along. These are eight different categories of nudges. In the interest of time, I'll highlight a few and, and some that are particularly helpful in the world of stewardship. Default rules is probably the most common type of nudge that's used where you make the most desirable option the default. So make it easy for people to choose the right thing. That means if there's a specific antibiotic that is most likely to be appropriate, that should be the antibiotic that shows up first on the list. And maybe sometimes it's the only antibiotic on the list. Uh, social norms. So people like to behave as their peers do. So if you show people how uh, peers behave, it's more likely that clinicians are going to try to uh, step in line with that uh, behavior. A pre-commitment is another example here. And that involves having a clinician pledge ahead of time to a certain behavior. And once you've made that pledge, there's a tendency to feel accountable to that initial pledge and continue to do that behavior over time. So I have some nice examples of how that's played out in practice. This is a really nice, easy to remember mnemonic called EAST framework. So it, this is things to remember if you're trying to think of a way to improve behavior in your clinical practice. So EAST stands for easy, attractive, social, and timely. So simplifying using defaults, making things attractive and salient for uh, the clinician, um, encouraging some social aspects to prescribing. So showing what model behavior looks like and then making those recommendations timely at the point of care when clinicians like uh, are most likely to be responsive to them. So this is an example of making it easy 
and is an example of the use of defaults. So this was a study that we did in Ontario, Canada, where we looked at over 100,000 positive urine cultures from 48 outpatient laboratories in the province. And we found that there was really wide variability in how laboratories reported their results. Sometimes they would report fluoroquinolones all the time. Some labs would never report fluoroquinolones. Some labs would report amoxicillin, others wouldn't. So there was a lot of variability in the types and the numbers of antibiotics that were reported. But what we found is that when a laboratory showed an antibiotic on the report, that antibiotic was about threefold more likely to be selected. So what you show people is more likely to be selected. That's kind of obvious, um, but it really highlights the importance of the laboratory in improving antimicrobial stewardship by uh, what they actually show clinicians and how they show them uh, that information. So we took this information to heart in a study that we did in a hospital where we found that fluoroquinolones were probably being used too much. We had a problem with C. difficile and we felt we needed to do something to reduce our fluoroquinolone use. So what we did was on our laboratory reports, anytime it was a fully susceptible enterobacter alleys, we would hide the ciprofloxacin. So we tested for it, but we would remove it. If it was susceptible, it would be off the report. And so you could see before versus after, after ciprofloxacin is no longer on the report. And a simple change like that was associated with about a half, a twofold reduction in ciprofloxacin prescribing. And as a result, we saw some improvements in ciprofloxacin susceptibility over time as well. So this is a fairly low cost intervention that can be used to help guide um, decision making. Some other examples I'd like to highlight are the use of nudging comments that can be included on laboratory reporting. And this, these have been um, studied more increasingly in the last few years. Um, this is a neat study that was done in, in um, Canada on, on the left hand side here, which is in midstream urine cultures and in patients, instead of reporting the positive urine culture, they actually had a comment that said the majority of positive urine cultures from inpatients without an indwelling catheter represent asymptomatic bacteriuria. So if you strongly uh, suspect your patient has developed a UTI, please call the laboratory. So they basically didn't see the results. And what this found is that it increased appropriateness of treatment. It didn't result in any under treatment, but the, the study authors indicate that we need a, a larger trial to ensure that this is a um, safe and effective approach, but very promising way to help improve prescribing and reduce the unnecessary use for asymptomatic bacteria. Study in the middle here um, is a nice study done in the United States where they simply added to the comment when there's commensal respiratory flora, they added the comment, no staph aureus, no pseudomonas aeruginosa, because they knew that clinicians were looking for those organisms. They had started antibiotics against those organisms. And if they specifically called them out, the clinicians felt more comfortable de-escalating therapy. So that improved de-escalation of anti-MRSA and anti-pseudomonal treatment when those comments were shown. A nice and simple, low cost intervention. And then finally, staph aureus bacteremia. We have good data that now that shows that getting infectious disease consults involved in staph aureus bacteremia can help improve patient outcomes. So what you can do is include a, co a comment on any positive staph aureus um, result in a bloodstream infection to indicate that the infectious disease consult should occur and that the drug of choice is uh, cloxacillin or cefazolin. This is a cool study that was done in the primary care setting in the US. It was a cluster randomized controlled stu uh, study um, in five clinics caring for uh, almost a thousand adults with acute respiratory tract infections. And as a reminder, most of those patients should not be treated with antibiotics. So what they did is in these clinics is they put a poster sized commitment letter up on the, uh, on the wall in the examination room. And the text is shown here on the right. In addition to the, the letter was also a spot for the photograph of the, uh, the physician, as well as a spot for the signature to show that the clinician pledged to prescribe antibiotics judiciously and not prescribe antibiotics for what appear to be viral infections. And as a result, the clinics who had this poster up were more likely to use antibiotics appropriately, a 20% absolute reduction in antibiotic prescribing which is fairly substantial given this is a, a fairly easy to do intervention. 
And I think it works because it works from both sides, the prescriber side, because there's some accountability there, there's a pre-commitment that they've made, and as well from the patient side, because they're managing expectations. The patient goes in expecting an antibiotic. There's some information there that explains why an antibiotic may not be necessary in every scenario. This was a study that we did as well in Ontario, where we sent out letters. Um, this is called peer comparison feedback. We send out letters to pro high prescribers in the province. So the important thing here is you need data on your prescribers. But once you have the data, you can identify who your high prescribers are. And so we took the top quartile of, of uh, physicians who prescribe the most antibiotics in Ontario. We sent them a letter saying, hey, did you know you're in the top quartile of prescribers? This was signed um, from uh, key credible sources within the province. And those clinicians got either an uh, initiation letter, so gave them some information about the most uh, uh, best practice guidelines for when to, uh, to initiate an antibiotic or uh, some other, another half of physicians got a letter that talked about duration. So what are the most evidence-based durations of therapy that, uh, that should be used for common infections seen in primary care? And this is the result of our study. This was published in JAMA Internal Medicine a couple of years ago. We had 3,500 physicians randomized, 1,500 received the initiation letter, and 1,500 received the duration letter, and then 500 were in the control group. And we found that those who received the letters, particularly the duration letter, um, you can see on the right hand side, a small but statistically significant reduction in antibiotic prescribing. So you would say 5%, that's pretty small. But in a population of 15 million people, um, this fairly low cost intervention was able to reduce antibiotics if we applied it across a population by about 150,000 less prescriptions. Um, and just under 2 million less uh, cost. Um, and that's just the cost of the antibiotics if you don't take into account the cost of uh, resistance and side effects that, that occur downstream. So another um, nice intervention that can be done to improve prescribing by making things uh, social. So in summary, um, I think I've, uh, I've shown you that human rationality has its limits. We all have cognitive biases that are at play throughout our, our work day. And the concepts of behavioral insights or nudging that I've talked about is rapidly emerging field in the healthcare and antimicrobial stewardship. So we can consider nudging in combination with other strategies that we're already using. So guidelines, education, perspective audit and feedback, they can be used in combination or as part of those strategies to improve antibiotic use. And some examples of low resource nudges that you could consider selective reporting and comments on microbiology reports, uh, social normative peer comparison feedback, and commitment, commitment messaging for um, uh, acute respiratory tract infections in primary care. And so these follow that EAST framework that I talked about, making it easy, attractive, social, and timely. So with that, I'll close and uh, turn it back to the speaker. And I'm happy to um, respond to any questions that the, the group may have.